Well, good evening, uh, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Asia Research Institute's final uh, Asia Trends series for this year. Uh, my name is Gavin Jones. Uh, I'm the uh, research leader for the cluster on the changing family in Asia at the uh, Asia Research Institute. Um, should just say a few things about the uh, Asia Research Institute, which we call ARI. Uh, before we get into the main event of the evening, because uh, we, we have a varied audience at the, at the OSA Trends, and uh, that, of course, is intentional. Uh, the OSA Research Institute is, uh, is an institute set up by the National University of Singapore about uh, eight years ago um, to focus uh, research attention on Asia and to be what the uh, president at that time termed pinnacle of excellence uh, in the US. There were a number of such pinnacles and we believe there are more over time. Um, but the, uh, it's an interesting institute because it uh, brings in uh, researchers from all over the world in, in various capacities. Uh, we have people come in for short terms, uh, three months, uh, sometimes six months or a year as uh, visiting fellows uh, who come to research and interact with people in the university. Uh, we have postdoctoral fellows who are here for a couple of years. We have some long-term uh, people continuing appointments in Hurry. And a lot of the uh, long-term staff in Hurry have joint appointments in other parts of the university as well. So the institute is supposed to be interacting closely with other parts of the university, not, not being an ivory tower. Uh, we have a number of uh, research clusters. There, there's one on uh, migration in Asia, there's one on religion and globalization, there's one on, on cultural studies, there's, there's one on Asian urbanism, so there's one on uh, society. Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, SDE, Society. Gosh. Science Technology. Science Technology, STI, Science Technology and Society. Um, sorry about that. Um, and we have an open cluster where we, where we bring in people who don't quite fit into any of uh, the clusters that uh, I've already, already mentioned. Um, we've had uh, a series of five um, uh, Asia Trends this year, and this is the, the final one. The topic of tonight's Asia Trends is um, <coughs> Families, children, and domestic workers in contemporary Asia. And uh, we're very honored to have Professor Rucker Ray here from uh, University of California, Berkeley. Um, I'm not going to give a lengthy introduction because I think most people here have already received the, uh, uh, the introductory information about this, but uh, I should say specifically that she's currently the Sarah Kailath Chair of India Studies Professor of Sociology and South and Southeast Asia Studies and Chair of the Center for South Asian Studies at the University of California in Berkeley. And her areas of specialization are gender and feminist theory, inequality, cultures of servitude and social movement. She has a number of books, uh, the most important of which for the evening's address, I think, is her, her book uh, published last year on cultures of servitude Modernity, Domesticity, and Class in India. And I think uh, what she'll be talking about tonight uh, will take off from some of the uh, material in that book. Um, following uh, Professor Ray's presentation, we'll have a commentary by Dr. Tio Yu Yan, um, who is with the uh, NTU, the Technological University, um, at, at this stage, but who was once uh, a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Ari and who was also once at the University of California, Berkeley. So there is a strong uh, Berkeley connection tonight. Um, and uh, she has written about various dimensions of family policies in Singapore, uh, how they're a site for understanding of state society relations, how they shape the meanings people attach to being Singaporean, and also their gendered implications. So when we, when we chose the topic for tonight, we thought this will be one which is not talked about much in Singapore, but uh, which really has interest to a great part of the Singapore population. 
and we expect that there should be some very lively discussion uh, following the two presentations this evening. So Professor Ray will talk for about, uh, about 40 minutes and then there will be a 20 minute presentation by the discussant and after that we'll have enough time for some uh, questions and answers. Uh, without any further ado, uh, let me welcome Professor Rocky Ray. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you to the uh, Asia Research Institute, particularly Professor Gavin Jones, and uh, thank you to um, Teo Yuyen, who was a former student of mine. And for those of you who have had the privilege of having students of your, of your own, you will know what a privilege it is to be um, sort of sharing uh, a space, an uh, intellectual space or a social space with one of your very dear students. So I'm very, very happy to be here today. Um, the talk that I will give today is indeed titled Families, Children and Domestic Workers in Contemporary Asia. But another way of looking at it, um, so if I were to give an alternative title, it would be Domestic Work and the Formation of Middle Class Identity. So um, let me start. In Taiwan, employers rate Filipina, Indonesian and Vietnamese maids by their cultural capacity for obedience and intelligence. In India, employers fret about the lost loyalty of a new generation of domestic workers. In Singapore, work permits are issued to maids on the condition that the women do not marry Singaporeans or become pregnant. Do employers and workers, of, do employers of workers in factories or laborers in fields or indeed of office clerks express such worries and concerns? Perhaps, but I think not. This is because domestic workers are unlike any other kind of worker. They work in people's homes. The sight of their work, the very heart of the household and family life, erases the usual divide between home and work and places workers in the position of, of caring for other people's homes and indeed other people's children children that are not theirs. So what is it about paid domestic work that marks it as different? Is it the site of home? It's, it, is it the site of work? Is it that, that it's at home? It is, uh, people work in isolation? It's associated with women who do the same work for love as opposed to for money? Is it the people who do the work? Across societies it has usually been slaves, <coughs> indentured labor, the poor, immigrants, um, or you know, in the case of India, people of, 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 uh, of lower castes. The answer appears to be some combination of the, of the above, but what I want to consider here today is particularly the question of the site of labor, the home. Where one person's refuge from labor is another person's site of labor. Where one person's space of privacy is another person's public arena. This question is important. For the institution of paid domestic work, far from becoming obsolete, um, as American sociologists had predicted um, after the Second World War, um, several American sociologists wrote and said, you know, this institution is not compatible with a modern society. Therefore, this institution of paid domestic work is on its way to obsolescence. But they have been proven wrong. Far from becoming obsolete, paid domestic work is making a comeback in many societies um, in which it had actually disappeared. It is now making a comeback. So in fact, what we now understand is that the association of paid domestic work is not so much with the question of a modern or a non-modern society, but it's actually a far stronger uh, association with inequality. So whether internal inequality or global inequality. So uh, a case of India is internal inequality. When there's enough internal inequality between sort of the wealthy and the, the not wealthy, you have uh, paid domestic workers. Or in the terms of global inequality, when there are societies that are more wealthy uh, than other societies globally, you get migrant paid domestic workers. So societies in which it has re-entered after a generation or so, are finding themselves scrambling to try to understand what the cultural rules of this institution are. And societies like India, in which it has had a long history, 
um, are trying to adjust to changes within it. So there's been over the past couple of decades, I think, a sort of a burgeoning literature on this, on paid domestic workers. Uh, and this literature sort of outlines the condition of their work, the particular vulnerability um, that comes uh, from sort of being foreigners working in, a con in another country, the difficulties of working in isolation, um, or the effects of the children the workers themselves leave behind in other countries when they come to do uh, work in, in, in foreign countries. But today I want to raise a different set of um, issues, a set of issues that have to do with the effect of the institution of paid domestic work on the middle class families themselves in which this work is done. This talk is indeed an extension of my book, um, Cultures of Servitude, which I co-authored with Simi Kayum. Um, but in this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss two things. First, I'm going to talk about what the presence of domestic workers in a middle class household means for the household in general. That is, what are the dynamics of having somebody who is not related to you, working for you in the home? And the second uh, question I'm going to address is how social hierarchies and indeed global inequalities such as race, class, and gender actually can get cemented and reproduced through this relationship. Now our research uh, for the book uh, focused primarily on India, though the last chapter of the book also focuses on New York. Um, but I believe that we, there will be resonance as I'm talking, uh, though my examples will come from mainly India and a couple from New York. I think there you'll find resonances with the institution of paid domestic work in many Asian countries. So the first part, the outsider in the home. I quote from my field notes. Supriya, an employer in her 60s, weeps when speaking of the man who helped raise her. But when she's talking about her present maid, she says, it's different now. Every time the maid goes home, I don't know if she'll come back. I don't expect loyalty. You love them and you look after them, but still they don't stay. Abigail Pogrebin in New York writes about a domestic worker who stole from her thus. I lurched from incredulity to rage to heartache. While another employer says of the domestic worker she has just fired, what I mind most is the betrayal of a friendship. Throughout the, our years of fieldwork in New York and in India, we heard these words, love, betrayal, hurt, resentment, friendship. And I want to bring these words to your notice because these are not words you hear very commonly in relation to other employment. So between you know, managers and factory workers, right? These are not commonly used words for other, other sites of employment. And it's really the, the, the use of these feeling words that made us think of the home as a distinctive site. The home is not an emotionally neutral site. It is the site of love, trauma, and emotion. And while some young employers do wish for a more impersonal relationship, um, with, their, uh, with their employee, with their domestic worker, most people don't want a purely impersonal relationship with the domestic worker at home. So employers have historically um, deployed these sort of personal, such as she's just like one of the family or she is a member of our family while addressing this relationship. And these personalistic themes um, can be thought of as sort of ideological strategies that allow some sort of inequality and domination to be perceived on a different register. That if, that if you use these words of love and this language of, of, of what we call the rhetoric of love, then relationships that are fundamentally about inequality um, get reinterpreted in the different terms of trust, affection, and dependency. And it's the necessity of these ideological strategies that I think really mark the site of home as distinctive. So this, this rhetoric of love, rhetoric of intimacy and family, it used to be a mode of labor control in an earlier period, let's just call it loosely a feudal period. And that mode of control through the rhetoric of love and family has been only partially offset by a more contractual mode, right? So the rhetoric of love and intimacy suggests 
that domestic workers are part of the family. And this rhetoric is not just, uh, we find in India, we find it in Sri Lanka, in Indonesia, um, perhaps in Singapore, uh, but certainly uh, in the US as well. And this rhetoric sort of encompasses employer claims of affection and, and family relationships that bind domestic workers and employers to each other. Okay. Now, I don't want to say it's a deliberately, uh, it's a deliberate discourse just to bind workers to you. I think it's more complicated than that. I think both workers and employers um, feel more comfortable with, uh, with a, a discourse of love and affection. Right? Um, so it's a complex discourse that it, it hides exploitation, yes, but it also makes exploitation bearable. Thus, many older employers miss the relationships they had with full-time workers uh, with whom they grew up. And, you know, they will, uh, they feel almost that the kind of workers they had, the kind of relationship they had with the workers as they grew up, defined the kind of people they were as a family. You know, we were the kind of people who looked after our workers. They could, they could depend on us. So it defined the kind of family they were. <laughs> Younger employers, today's employers, on the other hand, especially now talking about young employers in their 30s and 40s, they struggle to create a more contractual relationship, more professional relationship with their workers. They seek a more impersonal relationship with domestic workers, and they actively want to avoid the responsibility um, of these sort of relationships of love and care with their mates. Many younger women employers in Calcutta um, which I, I will slip between the word Calcutta and Kolkata because it's, it's, it's changed uh, the name recently. Many younger women, uh, women employers in Kolkata expressed discomfort with sort of the expectations that the workers had of a relationship that extended beyond the contract. So Biji, a young employer uh, who works for an NGO, a women's NGO, she's talking about her relationship with her maid um, she came from a family where they usually had uh, male domestic workers, and, but she has a woman. She says, there's far more tension now with the women around because they open up and they talk to you and they expect you to um, relate to their emotions and their problems. The male servants, they would never, never do that. So but now we have to get far more involved with their personality, their personal problems. They expect you to understand. Another young employer, who's impatient with this personal relationship says, I'm constantly trying to attain that level where I am least vulnerable to them. I want to be much less, I want it to be much less of a relationship, she said to me. I want it to be just come, do the job, take your money, and that's it. I can't afford to devote time to building relationships. I'm a worker, she's a worker. I don't tell my boss my problems, I don't want to hear her problems. So she's trying to move it into a different kind of contractual relation. Yet when it comes to her own child, she actually doesn't want a purely contractual relationship. She doesn't want her child to be brought up in an impersonal way. She would like the kind of affection and sort of personal touch that uh, she was brought up with by her child care, the, the, the woman who brought her up. So she says, so I'd like, I would prefer my daughter to be at home with one person who's like a grandmother. So I'd like to build my relationship with that person as an exceptional case for the sake of my daughter. I would still prefer her to be at home rather than at a daycare center, but all other jobs should be done along the Western model. Right, so the Western model here applies contract, right? But where childcare is concerned, she doesn't actually want that contract. So on the one hand, young women professional employers struggling to manage multiple demands, would like to dispense with the reciprocal ties of the old order, yet their need for loving childcare um, complicates this uneasy relationship. What employers appear to want is a contract which contains a sort of bounded loyalty and affection. Our research suggests that what does change over time is that in this, in this job, it's never it never becomes a purely contractual relationship. The form of the personal relationship changes. In the old order, say the feudal order, it was more vertical. Now it may be more slightly more horizontal. Um, but the, the contract and personal remain tied in this, in this particular 
It doesn't become ever purely contractual. Let me move to the second part, and that's about the reproduction of hierarchies. Drawing on French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu's analysis of class distinction, how class distinction is culturally managed, I suggest that the maintenance of domestic workers confirms the attainment of middle class uh, status and confers attributes of prestige, cultural capital, and civilization on employers. The cultivation of social and uh, cultural class distinction normalizes and even naturalizes the relationship of domination and exploitation which underlies the institution of domestic servitude in India and elsewhere. So in managing households with domestic workers, the Indian middle classes reproduce as normal or natural an unequal society where groups naturally divide along class lines and in which lower classes naturally serve the higher classes. Domestic service then must be seen as an institution that not only produces cleanliness, food, and childcare, which we know it does, but it also produces class. Distinction and status difference can be maintained in many ways between workers and employers. Um, they can be maintained through rituals of deference. They can be maintained by asking workers to wear uniforms. They can be maintained um, by uh, expecting particular forms of address, what you call the worker and what the worker calls you. That's what, you know, these are ways in which status distinctions are maintained. But I'm going to focus on one central issue, particularly relevant to those of you who live in apartments. It's the issue of spatial intimacy in the context of social distance. <laughs> when the Indian middle classes once lived in detached homes, detached houses, they are now mostly to be found in apartment buildings, sometimes as small as 650 square feet. Thus, several adjustments have had to be made in their practices vis-a-vis -vis domestic workers, as they have had to contend with the shrinking space of the apartment. Of particular concern is the adaptation to the ever-present body of the domestic worker and new spatial management in, a restricted, in the restricted space of a flat. So, one older employer says, she's sort of reflecting about uh, sort of the, the space of a house, sort of the one this, let's see, Call them these detached bungalows and versus the space of a, of a small apartment. And so she says, in this new social milieu, this is the apartment, there is no place for a person living in your home who is not a relative or a friend. In those days, when you had servants living in the house, there was space. They weren't mingling with you all the time. In a flat, you don't have that, your own space. You don't have physical space, so you have to create your distance. They are physically always there. If you become too close in a flat, you don't have your own privacy. The modern flat indeed was not designed for the extended family or the multi-generational joint family, but rather for a modern nuclear family. A domestic worker has no place in the ideology of a modern nuclear family. Yet the middle classes who are creating nuclear families in India carry with them the assumption, sort of originating from an older time, that households cannot be run without domestic workers. Indeed, I've had uh, employers who said point blank, you can't run a middle class household without domestic workers. But these two new uh, nuclear middle class families, typically married couples, both working outside the home with one or more children, they have to then make their own compromises. Some, for example, have decided that they don't actually want to deal with the relationship with the domestic worker, so they uh, make arrangements that they come home from work and the domestic worker leaves immediately, having cooked dinner and looked after the child. So there isn't much sort of interaction with them. They don't have to actually interact or deal with the presence of a non-family member for too long in the presence of, in this sort of space of the flat that is meant for nuclear families. One issue, the, one way the issue was dealt with in the past was by asserting that the worker was part of the family, but, but this is changing as we have seen. There are rules at once explicit and yet unspoken that are meant to govern domestic worker comportment or behavior in the space of the home. One clear rule concerns where they are allowed to sit. The simple act of sitting 
question of where one's body may be placed. Like many other practices that are embedded in unequal relationships of power, turn into what we have called the politics of sitting. So now I'm going to quote from a woman who's in her 60s, and she's um, sitting uh, across and she's telling us with great affection about um, the two uh, people who work for her. One is a man whose name is Arjun, and one is a woman whose name is Saraswati, and they've, lived, uh, they've worked with her, and they've, they've lived with her for a long time. She says, in my heart, I'm sure I'm feudal. I would not want Arjun to sit on my sofa. I don't mind him sitting at my table, but not my sofa. We watch TV together, she says, and I make him watch Discovery Channel. Now he is addicted to Discovery Channel, but before that he used to watch cricket and movies. This is an improvement. And this is also a promotion, she says, because we are both watching together. He is sitting on a stool rather than on the floor. When we watch TV, I sit on the sofa, Arjun sits on a stool, and Saraswati sits on the floor. In common with many other employers in our study, this woman self-consciously sort of contrasts feudal with modern or democratic ways of being through her relationship to the domestic worker. In this case, through her analysis of the politics of sitting. In other words, the move from a feudal world to a modern world is marked for her through the body of her worker. It reflects the gradual erasure of spatial distance between his body and the employer body as he moves up from the floor. But it's an erasure which must remain incomplete because he will never actually sit on the sofa. But there's something else about uh, this story that I want to bring to your attention, and that is the question of TV and TV watch, television watching. Um, many employers in India are very fretful because now more, uh, most Indian families have one television. And now most domestic workers actually, especially live in, um, they, they very much expect to be able to watch TV. Now this has become a matter of great concern to employers uh, in India. They complain that their domestics insist on being allowed to watch television in the evenings. The question is, for them, how to maintain social distinction in the smaller spaces of the flat when shared television watching could mean a shared experience and shared emotional proximity. If you're watching the same shows and you're experiencing the same emotions, it, it creates a certain intimacy which many, domestic, uh, which many employers try to avoid. So what our employer that I just quoted uh, did was, instead of watching movies um, with Arjun, she introduces him to Discovery Channel, a science channel. And she really believes that she has sort of, um, sort of lent to his sort of uplift. She, she's given him some education. And in some sense, it really reiterates the kind of colonial traces of um, sort of, 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 of civilizing the, the natives by, by teaching them the right, the right things to watch and the right things to read. So, so as with TV watching, there are other sorts of um, markers uh, between uh, domestic workers and employers that are being sort of blurred, and that is making employers um, that are making employers anxious. So, for one thing, um, employers are very, very anxious that. Domestic workers are trying to erase class distinction by appearing to be more like employers through the clothes they wear and the makeup they use, for example. One story that I want to just relate to you um, was uh, related to us by uh, a gentleman who was, uh, he lived in, a, in an apartment building, and he said, he told me the story three times, you know, in the space of 45 minutes. So you can tell that it really bothered him. And the story is this. He was riding up in his uh, elevator, uh, in his apartment building, and there was a little child uh, in a school uniform. And so he pats the child on the head and asks her, um, which flat do you live in? And the child says to him that she lives in the servants' quarters. Right? What disturbed him, him was that he couldn't tell. He couldn't tell that this was the child of a domestic worker. He mistook her for a child of an employer. He told me the story three times because it disturbed him that he could not tell. 
right? That, and and, and so there's a huge anxiety um, about this, that you have to be able to tell. Um, and, that, and that if the domestic workers have, had, have a little bit of extra money, well, they should spend this on something uplifting like education, not on makeup and clothes that can only cause confusion and, and consternation by enabling sort of young domestic workers or their children to acquire a middle class appearance because that's just one step away from acquiring middle classness and that you know, is, is just too risky. Right? Um, but in these discussions when they're phrased, they're always phrased in terms of how good it is for the domestic workers as opposed to the anxiety over the collapse of distinction. Let me now consider the, the generational reproduction of this. Children. Some employers remember a time when they were children, when they did not understand the difference between, the, the sort of the class difference between themselves and the maid who was looking after them. In two cases, they recalled touching the feet of the maids. Now in India, it's a gesture of respect that you make to people who are older than you. So say on, on New Year's Day, you, you touch the feet of the, of, of the elders. So in two cases, um, employers told us that they recalled touching the feet of their maids and realizing by the sudden silence of the adults present that this was an inappropriate gesture. Indeed, an unacceptable one for lower classes, in relation to lower classes. Thus it is in small gestures and unspoken moments that children learn about the hierarchical and unequal orders of daily life. An elderly employee, employer now in his 80s directly learned, uh, leaked learning about class inequality and gender inequality in relation to domestic workers and his siblings, his female siblings. He says, how did we learn to treat servants? We realized we were superior to them. They were obedient. We saw how our parents treated them. We were taught, mind you, never to abuse them, never to scold them or call them names or hit them. But since I was very young, I remember ordering them about. There was nothing wrong with it. And if the servant wasn't there, we would just tell our sister to do it. So children learned by observing their parents the habits, discourses, and practices of Kolkata's culture of servitude. Just as children learned that domestics constituted a distinctive class, so too they learned that girls were closer to domestic work to domestic workers than boys, both as human beings and as labor. While in some cases, children are not chastised for abusing domestic workers, as in Christine Chin's study of foreign domestic workers in Malaysia, where children are seen hitting the domestic workers or calling them stupid. In many cases, children who grew up um, are told by the parents not to behave badly with domestic workers, but they still grow up to look down on the class, of, of the entire class of domestic workers. And that's what I'm trying to get, get at, that it can happen very unconsciously. Signs that her son seems to be learning from his grandmother to distinguish domestic workers as a separate class dismays Viji, an employer. And she says about her son, she says, Aditya now tells me things like, Maya has got to do this because she's our servant. I get really upset because I'm trying to bring this kid up with different values, trying to make him understand that these people are coming to work for us just as much as we are going out to work. There's no dis difference. But he says she's a servant. There's a clear distinction when he says that. There's a clarity. He can do things with Maya which he can't do with me or anybody else who is older under normal circumstances but he can do it with them because they're servants. Viji is certainly not alone in her worry about bringing up a child who is learning distinction despite her best efforts to inculcate sort of more egalitarian values and perspectives. In societies which rely heavily on paid, to, uh, on paid labor to raise their children, um, many are beginning to worry about um, its effects. So in, a, in an article written for International Migration Review a few years ago, uh, Brenda Yeo, Sherlina Huang, and Joaquin Gonzalez um, uh, quote a, a Montessori school teacher in Singapore. And this school teacher says, and I quote, 
I became even more aware of the effect of maids on children after I started running my own kindergarten. Particularly mine, because mine is a, a Montessori method. The whole Montessori education is based on the use of your hands and training children to become independent. So, if you're talking about that when you have maids, what happens is that the children are being fed, the children don't know how to tie their own shoes, they don't know how to bring their own drinks. So you know we're actually stunting their growth. For the most part, the children in our study did learn distinction. They did learn to distinguish between domestic worker and employer categories and to convert these perceptions and practices into sort of internalized dispositions about what it means to treat a servant as a servant. We saw this on multiple occasions. So when we would be visiting various homes, there would be, um, there are many uh, children who work as domestic workers in India as well, as you, be, as you may be familiar with. So we would see children who are playing with other children and they're distributing sweets uh, to the other children, but they will skip the domestic worker who is also a child, right? Or um, if they're playing with an older domestic worker, uh, they're playing ball with an older domestic worker, they will expect that older domestic worker to always run and fetch the ball, right? So you'll see, we, we, you just see all around you, you know, if you, if you just open your eyes to this, you will see it all around you. And if you add to this class perception, the fact that domestics are often of a different race or a different ethnic group or caste, we can see how this may create an impression in the child's mind of an entire group. The late great African-American uh, poet Audre Lorde remembered um, being in the, in the south of the United States and she was wheeling her two-year-old daughter um, in a shopping cart to a supermarket. And as you may know, in the south, most of the domestic workers were in fact African-American. Um, so, uh, so this African-American poet is wheeling her little two-year-old daughter in a shopping cart through a supermarket and she sees a little white girl also being wheeled by her mother in a shopping cart on, coming towards her. And this little two-year-old white girl uh, calls out excitedly when looking at Audrey Lord's daughter, look mommy, a baby maid. Okay. The next part of this talk is called When Men Are Let Off the Hook. For young dual career couples, in India, in the US, Taiwan, or in Singapore, the hiring of a domestic worker is done primarily because while women are increasingly taking on work outside the home, the corresponding shift has not taken place within the home. To put it bluntly, men simply won't do housework, and women have lost the struggle to make them. As one young corporate executive, a man, said to me, I think that I do the major part of the household work. After all, I earn the money. If I didn't do that, no household tasks could be done smoothly. Young male employers today continue to significantly take on the role of patriarch, assuming even if their wives work, and even if their wives earn as much as they do, that the responsibility for economic well-being of the household is still theirs alone. In this way, hegemonic ideals of masculinity and femininity are sustained. And even in those cases where the women may earn more than the men, their duty to family and home continues to be supreme. The cover of a recent issue of a women's magazine in Kolkata, for example, shows a split photograph of the same woman. On the top of the photograph, she's speaking on the phone, uh, clearly at work, on the bottom, she's cooking. And the cover story is, argues in effect that the problems of working women arise from the fact that their status as working women is still not quite legitimate. The argument is that in India, middle class women are still supposed to be primarily responsible for the home, such that their own ambition, which takes them outside the home, is something they feel guilty about. The dominant ideology is indisputably that men are responsible for life outside the home and women for life within the home. Um, yeah. Now it may be supposed that the labor of hired workers helps working women to avoid bitter disputes with their husbands uh, over domestic division of labor. 
that are that, that are so commonplace, especially in places uh, where you have dual career couples and, and no domestic worker. Some domestic workers said to me outright that they believe they have saved their employers' marriages. However, Hillary Standing's analysis of Kolkata households um, with employed uh, women produces the sort of perhaps surprising uh, result that women with domestic workers do not necessarily spend less time in the domestic sphere than women without, because they still have to manage the household, and though they get freed up from doing certain tasks, they do other tasks, right? In other words, it may well be that the hiring of domestic workers enables married couples to get along better, but it also means less of a challenge to the traditional division of labor, such that men do not have to take on domestic chores, which remain the woman's responsibility and also remain devalued. Let me conclude. Paid domestic work is an institution that lies at the very heart of middle class Indian families and to an increasing extent at the heart of middle class existence of many Asian countries. Yet, because the home is not thought of easily as a workplace, paid domestic work remains understudied. And we have yet to come to terms with its effects. In India, its very ubiquity gives it a taken for grantedness that has prevented its analysis as an institution. For other Asian countries, which rely on foreign domestic workers, it has been the foreignness of the domestic workers which has formed the focus of the attention. But as I hope I have showed here, paid domestic work is an institution with certain rules about who does the work for whom. And that this has consequences not only for the household, but because the household is the basic unit of society, it has consequences for society in general. Paid domestic work plays a central role in the formation and maintenance of middle class identity. <coughs> middle class employers enact the immutability of class through their words and labor practices at home, through their ordering of space, their refusal to engage in manual work at home, their assumptions of control over other people's labor. They enact the immutability of a gendered order by paying other people, particularly women, to do the undesirable but vital labor of maintaining, of maintaining domestic order and of keeping their children clean, well-fed, and secure. And inasmuch as workers come from other countries, other ethnic groups, or other castes, employers enact and reproduce perceptions of the inferiority of these groups. And it is in this way through the business of living daily life, through the minutiae of daily routine, when the home becomes a site of paid labor, global inequalities are reproduced. Thank you very much. to comment on Professor Raquel Ray's talk tonight. Uh, as, as Raka and Gavin both mentioned, she was my advisor when I was in graduate school, and she continues to be a great friend and mentor. So um, I've admired and respected her work for a long time, and I've been particularly moved by her most recent book, Cultures of Servitude. So um, I want to thank her for being here, and also to the Asian Research Institute, and especially uh, Professor Gavin Jones, for making this event happen. So I've been tasked tonight uh, with speaking about the relevance of Professor Ray's talk and her, her study to the Singapore context. And I suspect that the topic is something many of you already have thoughts about. Um, and you may already have made a lot of your own connections as you listen to her. I hope some of what I say in the next few minutes will resonate with what you're thinking and that some of it will depart in ways that, are, uh, that will provoke a lively uh, discussion later on. So in general, when the words culture and made are invoked together in the everyday Singapore context, 
people mean something quite different from what Professor Ray has just talked about today. Uh, many people complain about the fact that their mates have different values and that they, they don't want their children to grow up with these alien values. Together with the fear of child abuse, this is often cited as the reason for wanting grandparents to be around, even when domestic workers are effectively primary caregivers. Uh, maid agencies, too, often refer to different habits or practices uh, that the women may have and try to socialize them into ways that are more in line with so-called Singaporean culture. Now, what we've heard today is a very different conception of culture and values. Um, so in my comments tonight, I want to highlight how Professor Ray has used these concepts of culture and values. And I want to talk about how they suggest alternative ways for thinking about the contemporary problem of domestic workers in Singapore. First, culture and values and their transmission. So most people know, of course, that values and beliefs are not passed on through textbook knowledge or through formal education. Hello. Now those who are parents have probably experienced the shock of seeing their children make gestures or say words that uh, they themselves use, of course, but their you know, kids are not supposed to use. Um, and it's this knowledge about culture being transmitted through everyday learning that makes parents worry about their kids having domestic workers as primary caregivers. Yet, in the public discourse about domestic workers and values, it's quite rare to hear what Professor Ray has presented today. That kids growing up with servants learn a lot about inequality, about gender, class, and ethno-racial differences, and about their own place within gender hierarchies, racial hierarchies, class hierarchies. They don't so much identify with their caregivers as identify against them. And how do they learn to distance themselves from the very people who feed them, who bathe them, who bring them to the playground? Uh, Professor Ray mentions the politics of sitting, the politics of space in general. Right? We can imagine in the case of Singapore, some children learn that their caregivers are different from them when they see that within their homes, these women sleep in tiny rooms with no windows. Other children learn when they see that it's this person who attends social gatherings in order to help with the cleaning up and to do the dishes. Most of them learn that this is the only person in the household who is doing chores well before anyone else is awake and well after everyone else ends their workday. She's also the only person who is working every day. Uh, in many households with only one or two days off a month, um, in some with none at all. Right? Many, many of these children learn when they hear their parents openly and flippantly discussing with other adults their main problems. Um, I meet a lot of children um, with their domestic worker caregivers at the playground every evening. And for the most part, I see children have a great capacity for love. They hug their caregivers, they listen when given instructions. But I also see a fair number of children treating their caregivers as lesser beings. Uh, discussing amongst themselves uh, their caregivers with language like my mate, your mate, or barking orders and making demands loudly and authoritatively. And as Raka mentioned um, with her anecdote uh, referring to Brenda's work about the preschool teacher's comments, I see many kids rely on their domestic worker caregivers to do things that they should be doing for themselves. Culture is transmitted through everyday practice. Professor Ray's work alerts us to the fact that we should be worried not only about alien habits and values, but our own. We should be worrying about what we are teaching our children through how domestic work is organized and structured, and how housekeepers and caregivers fit within our homes. And I use the words organized and structured very deliberately. Because the second point about culture and values that Professor Ray's work highlights is that culture and structure interact. 
And that has really important implications. When I give the example of uh, workers who live in windowless rooms or workers having only one or two or no day offs, um, it's not meant merely as an indictment on the part of individual employees. Uh, Professor Ray, like many other sociologists, has shown that sometimes how things are done have very little to do with people's intentions and beliefs. So there are reasons that certain employer practices are taken for granted. Now, given the particular rules and regulations about domestic work, for example, their pay scale, or their lack of mandated hours or days of rest, um, there follow norms for how they are perceived and treated as workers. So most employers in Singapore are being perfectly reasonable given the structural parameters. They are paying domestic workers the rate they've been told to pay. They're providing them with the basics of food and shelter. Um, and some of them are giving them rest days out of the goodness of their hearts. This last thing, of course, is in sharp contrast to most of us in this room, whose bosses' good hearts are generally left out of the equation when deciding how many days off we have. Um, in Professor Ray's interviews, we see employers who struggle with teaching their kids to be respectful um, to their servants. They are well-meaning people, people with good intentions. But their kids come to the conclusions of their own about servants because they have learned over time that this is the lowest person within their homes because of the work that they do and because of the ways that they do it. I think this resonates very strongly with the Singapore case. Now we do hear, of course, from time to time, you know, cases of grotesque or abuse of maids, but I think that's the minority, right? I believe that most people in Singapore are just trying to do, um, just trying their best to do right by their families. Employing domestic workers uh, is not, for many people, an easy decision. And I think most people treat their domestic workers decently. But I think it's time to think about how, as a society, we should figure out ways to alter the structural circumstances so that we're not depending on individual decency and the goodness of people's hearts in the treatment of domestic workers as workers. I think it's time to up the ante to think about how, as a society, we can put in place rules and regulations that protect the dignity of this group of vulnerable workers. And several local NGOs, of course, like uh, Transit Workers Come To and like Home, have done really important work in precisely this direction. Now, what Professor Ray's work makes clear is that this work should be done not just on behalf of domestic workers, but also for the good of our own and our, own, and our children's values. If we want our kids to learn to treat people with respect, to not take for granted their own relative privilege, if we want them to learn that being human is not just about being smart, but about knowing how to do some very basic things to take care of themselves, if we want them to see the family and the home as a place of equality and respect, rather than gender and racialized injustice and exploitation, if we want them to see and experience Singapore as a meritocracy committed to ethno-racial equality, then we actually have to start here in our homes. Now this brings me to my final point. Professor Ray's conceptualization of culture and values suggests that we are all implicated. What she and her co-authors show in their book is that there is a culture of servitude that permeates Indian society. Now it's true in their case, they look at a group of people for whom servants have been a long tradition and where they are near universal within this class. Singapore does not share quite that same historical context. The numbers are, are growing. Uh, last I checked, 196,000. Um, but they're not quite universal, in, among, even among the middle class. But given, even given those differences, I think we're already starting to develop a very comparable culture of servitude. So many of us within our relatively new middle class are already forgetting how to wash the dishes, do the laundry, scrub the toilet. And certainly many, even given the opportunities and as mothers, and particularly as fathers, have not learned how to feed a child, how to change a diaper, how to give a child a bath. And our kids are taking all this in 
as their common sense. But even beyond the people who are directly implicated, whether or not you have children, whether or not you employ a foreign domestic worker, you are implicated. Because all of us are living in this society that is cultivating new norms about gender practices, about ethno-racial, ethno-national and class inequalities, and about the value of domestic labour and the people who perform them. So Professor Ray's book, I think, ultimately suggests that we can't just say, oh, it's up to the individual, or assume that kids will turn up with good values if their parents teach them good values. If we really care so much about the, the culture and the values that our kids invite, then we need to be thinking about what we are teaching our kids through the way our society treats domestic workers. I'll end on that note, um, and again thank Professor Raka Ray and the Asia Research Institute for this opportunity. For us to address this, um, I think, rather uncomfortable and difficult set of issues, and I hope that many of you will participate and share your perspectives, um, and given what we've heard tonight, think about how we should be moving forward. Thank you.